Right. Hello, everyone. Good to see you this afternoon and um, a very warm welcome on behalf of Angel Academy. Um, I'm Sarah Turner from anyone who hasn't met me and I'm joined this afternoon by Simon Hopkins and Michelle McQueen, who are the other members of the Angel Academy team. Um, we've been running Investor Academy for six years as, a, as an in-person workshop, but in a, a COVID inspired pivot, um, one of many, we're now running it online for both investors and founders. Um, the overall objective of these sessions is to clarify what goes on in angel networks, but specifically this one. Um, and this is our second investment, uh, Investor Academy, second episode, and we're lifting the lid on how in angels can support their portfolio. As usual, if you can use chat to submit your questions, you can do this at any point um, and we'll be looking out for them and we'll put them to our panel a bit later on. Um, but it's become a bit of a tradition on these webinars um, to ask at the start how everyone is feeling. So if you could tell us on chat how you are on a scale to, of one to five. So five being highly optimistic, one down in the dump. So we'd love to see what you're feeling all oh, right good i like to see some fours there's a few threes one five <laughs> excellent um okay right a second question for you um just very briefly um how are you typically supporting your angel investments obviously the the immediate answer and the most important answer is money but do you do anything on top of that so we've had a few yeses i do realize i've posed that as a closed question but um Yes. So what what very briefly do you on, do on top? This is not any formal research. It's just really useful to get a bit of a quick, quick poll. Great. So some people have said advisory board. Meeting with founders, project type engagement, network, access to network. That's a really big one. Uh, strategic advice, share network is possible. Yeah, okay. And another five has just come in, so that's great. Thank you, that's, that's really interesting. So uh, Angel Academy, um, we're not a women only network, but our core mission has always been around improving gender diversity in the investor community. Um, women are still only 15% of angel investors, but the evidence is that we're two to three times more likely to back female founders. So this gender gap really matters. Um, and um, very frustratingly, I think um, angel investing is actually far more accessible and fun than most women think, if they've even heard about it. Um, so built a network and wanted to get the, the word out about that. And, create something that really worked for women. Didn't exclude men, but worked for both women and men. So we've invested in 33 businesses so far. All are female founded and all are in tech. Most are purpose as well as profit driven. Um, and we've continued investing through the pandemic and are very proud to have added several new companies to our portfolio. Um, as well as following on in some of our existing investments. Um, but it's got to be said, the funding environment is much tougher, especially for these companies that are still at early stage. So onto the subject of today's session, um, how angels typically support their portfolio. Um, this came from a... a um, uh, a survey that was uh, carried out last year and then a, a, a bit more in the summer. Um, so there's a wide variety of ways in which angels will um, support their portfolio. Um, and unlike investing in funds or in the stock market, um, angel investing isn't 
passive. Um, but how you support the businesses you invest in can be very light touch or it can be more hands on. Um, it depends. It depends, I think, is the most common answer to any question that I'm ever asked about angel investing. Uh, it depends entirely on what the business needs, you know, what you personally have to offer and almost also how much time you have. Um, we're all extremely busy, so um, uh, we, you know, we know that people don't have a huge amount of time for it. Um, but like our approach to due diligence, um, we use a collaborative and structured approach to supporting investments uh, post investment um, and kind of feeling your way around how how you can how you can work with founders um, comes with experience. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to three of our investors this afternoon who are going to tell you tell you more about how they support their portfolio. Also, some of the experiences they've had as um, as founders themselves or as board members. Um, I've asked each of them to introduce themselves and then talk for five minutes. So we're going to kick off with Maya. If you'd like to turn your camera and mic on, Maya, um, please take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Maya Kazalti. Um, I've been investing with Angel Academy for, I think, close to two years now. Um, and I um, have had a varied career, started with data and fintech, um, then left that to start my own company, which was um, in the experience industry, and then went flip side and went and worked with an investment manager who then invested in startups. So now I'm actually the chief of staff at one of the startups I advised, OMI, um, which is quite exciting in a completely new sector. Um, so I guess I, I'm going to speak to you kind of wearing two different hats. So the first few points I put up here is with my investor hat on. I know we hear this a lot, but being a trusted sounding board for the founder is a really important part of being an angel investor. Being a single founder in particular, I can say from experience, can be very lonely. Um, and they need trusted advisors who can listen without judgment and, and provide sound advice. So that's a really, really crucial way that you can be supportive as an investor. Um, personally, I try to meet with um, the founder, particularly single founders um, for some of my smaller investments once a year for a coffee, just to be available to, to listen for whatever they wanna talk about. Um, in terms of valuation, I mean, again, you've heard this before, valuation is an art, not a science, particularly when you have a very tiny company with not many KPIs, not much traction, it, it's really difficult to actually pinpoint a number. And I, I noticed being part of due diligence teams, it, it can be very easy to focus on valuation because it feels tangible. However, as a founder, you're upskilling like crazy and, and you're trying to learn all these things. So um, sometimes it's more important to understand the way the founder thinks rather than the actual number that they land upon. And the third point is, again, one that's probably obvious, but it, it's about being a customer. And if you can't be a customer, be an advocate. So for me, I've invested in Tech Will Save Us. So everybody at Christmas and birthday parties gets Tech Will Save Us gifts. Um, for Nicks and Cakes, it's always when we could have cocktail parties, it's always one of the options. Um, and uh, for Medical, I haven't quite figured out how to be an advocate yet, but you know, I, I let all my pregnant friends know about it. Um, so now flipping sides kind of as, as being a founder, um, an area that I've definitely learned are critically important, especially when you're a small team, is really around culture and fit. And I'm gonna combine these last two points and, and values. Um, now being on the startup side of where we're starting to build out the team, this idea of you know, skills can be taught, but values need to be inherent. And if you really want a successful team as you're building a company, you need to make sure that the culture is right. Um, more and more nowadays as we're building the team um, at OMI where I'm currently at, we're finding that actually we're having much more success when we interview candidates based on values. We also find um, kind of the, the new generation of the workforce is very much focused on the, the right culture fit and are focused more about the missions, the values, and the culture is more important to them than the actual money. So it's a complete mind, mind shift. And so when we are looking at these companies as investors, um, 
these are things that are quite important to kind of be the glue to keep that company together. So I think that's my five and five, maybe less than five. But back to you, Simon. Or thank you, thank you, Maya. That's wonderful. So next up is um, is Lorraine. Hello, everyone. Great to see. Well, not see you. See your little black squares um, this afternoon on this rainy day. Uh, I have a very different background to Maya, and I think this sort of speaks to Sarah's point that really anybody can be an angel investor. Um, you don't have to necessarily have a finance background or a tech background. So my background is TV. I spent roughly the first half of my career as a documentary producer, um, both inside the BBC and outside working as a freelance. And the second half as an executive, I was the first woman to run BBC One. I'm the person who commissioned Strictly Come Dancing uh, and brought back Doctor Who. And then after that, I ran uh, what was then the UK's largest independent production company, Talkback Thames. And after that, I set up my own company, which was a very interesting experience um, in that I went very much into a, a male dominated world because uh, I, I went to private equity for investment. Um, and that was quite a shock having come from broadcasting, which is roughly 50-50 and certainly where, where women have a voice. Um, and at the moment, I'm the independent external advisor to Channel 4's growth fund. So in addition to my angel investing, I'm very involved um, with the production companies that Channel 4 invests in. And I act as an advisor to those companies. So I've got quite a lot of experience now of supporting small and growing companies. So my first thing is be supportive and act, act like a mentor. Um, this really feeds into Maya's point about it being very lonely if you're the founder. And you can feel like things are coming at you from all sides. And I think to have investors who you very much feel are in your corner um, is important. Um, and my approach in general to, uh, to managing people or leading people is always to be supportive as well. I, and I think that that is particularly true uh, of founders who, you know, when you set up your own business, somebody said to me, the highs are higher and lows are lower. And that is so true. Um, every little victory, you're punching the air. But when things go wrong, uh, it feels cataclysmic. And I think if you know you've got people around you who are supportive, that makes a big difference. Help founders stand up for themselves. Um, there's quite a lot of male bullying that goes on that I've witnessed. And particularly if the founder is the lone voice for the company in the boardroom or um, has multiple investors. So I was on the board of one of the companies um, and was quite shocked by the aggressive behavior of uh, a, a group of investors, that rep their representative who sat on the board with me um, and who frankly was acting as though he was on the board of a FTSE 100 company. Um, and the thing is these companies are are small um, and making demands that were not reasonable. And one of the things that I would do both before a board meeting and after would really get the founder to sort of steel herself to stand up to him. And indeed I would stand up for her as well and try to tone down um, some of his demands um, and criticisms. So I think, you know, just being there to give them a bit of metal can be good. The other thing is, and again, Maya referred to this when she talked about founders upskilling a lot, don't overestimate their experience of leadership and management. A lot of these people, their only experience is of running their own business. They are entrepreneurs, sometimes serial entrepreneurs, or they may have become an entrepreneur um, having not spent much time in a larger company or even progressed very much in their careers. So they are doing everything for the first time. And a lot of the things that you might assume would come naturally or be naturally part of um, somebody's experience when they're leading an organization isn't necessarily the case with founders. So again, you know, even little things like them learning how to manage their staff, get the best out of their staff, give them appraisals and feedback can be very challenging. And that's something I think through your conversations with them that you can work out. The other thing is to work out how you can add value. Um, you know, not every uh, business you invest in will need your skill set. So what is it that you've got that, that you can offer? And what is it that that company actually needs? Um, again, you know, my last point is remember the business is small, but 
you know, they don't need too much help from too many sources. So I think making sure that whatever support you can offer is welcome. Um, and that can be leveraging your contacts, which lots of people referred to in the survey. It can be being a mentor slash coach. It might be, it, it, you know, if, you, if you've got good financial skills helping on the financial side um, or marketing uh, again, or even recruitment, because again, um, getting the right cultural fit for these companies is important. And sometimes, I mean, I've seen a lot of companies struggle to get the outside their core team when they're recruiting new people to get the right team on board, particularly on the sales side. So maybe you can help with recruitment or even taking part in the interviews. Um, so I think that's my five minutes up and I'm now handing on to Laura, I believe. Thank you, Lorraine. That's wonderful. Laura. There you go, is that working, Hello. can you hear me? We can see you and hear you loud and clear. Thank you. You can see me. Unfortunately, I can't see myself, so I can't tell if my makeup's all over the place. <laughs> um, Not at all. Yeah, well, lovely. Um, thank you very much for inviting me onto the panel, uh, Sarah. So um, I'm Laura and uh, my background. So I started off as a buyer in um, the food industry. I then spent about 10 years um, in strategy consulting for Deloitte and for Booz Allen, um, advising retail and consumer brands. Um, and then I moved in-house, so heading up the uh, strategy team at Kingfisher and then moving into kind of digital at um, Selfridges. Um, when I left uh, about 18 months ago and, um, and now I'm, I've just launched my own brand. So uh, it's a clean, a sustainable cleaning brand called Steep. And I think partly inspired by everything that I've learned um, as an angel investor. So, um, and I've, yeah, I, I joined Angel Academy, I think about a couple of years ago. So um, I've, you know, and it's been a really steep learning curve. Um, and, you know, so the very first thing that I've probably learned and worked out how to, how to help um, portfolio companies is around strategic advice. So um, I think this was quite tricky because actually this is something that I thought that lots of people might value and I could add lots of value. But um, as Lorraine said, some of these businesses are really quite small. And so the things that I used to do in my old, um, in my old consulting days actually were just overkill. So over time, what I've, uh, how I help them is um, particularly when they're putting together three year plans or thinking about their next, next fundraise and what are they fundraising for? Um, I'll offer to um, help them think through how to structure it or um, maybe just act as a sounding board to some of their assumptions um, to see that if it makes sense or if there's any areas um, where they, you know, maybe they're, they're, have they prioritised the right decisions. Um, so, you know, it's less me um, really helping up front, but um, stress testing some of the things that they've done. Um, so that's the strategic advice and uh, and I also, you know, I found that some of the sector expertise, um, especially in retail and consumer, some of them are in that category, in that sector, but they perhaps don't understand, fully understand what it takes to win or some of the costs or um, strategies that work. So that's another way. So that, that whole area of strategic advice. Um, you know, I think, yeah, I, I think it has been fairly helpful, but I've probably over over egged it at times. Um, so the next one is public cheerleading. This is a super easy one to do. So um, on social media, you know, liking, commenting, sharing uh, on LinkedIn and Instagram and, and Facebook. Um, and I think it's also, you know, talking with other investors and peers and other customers and saying how marvellous, you know, for example, Stitched is who um, do these amazing curtains and blinds. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, if you really love the love the business that you've invested in that becomes a really easy thing to do but I think it makes quite a big difference um, for the businesses um, the next one that um, you know I think it has, uh, we've already mentioned is around connections and then this could be um, connecting fellow founders so you know a good example of this was um, there are two tech businesses that support retail and during Covid 
both of them, their sales fell off, their revenue fell off a cliff, um, you know, at the beginning of the of the of the uh, the pandemic. And actually, just they didn't really have anyone to talk. They didn't have another peer to talk to about it. About was it, are you seeing the same thing? What's working? And so I connected two of those founders together. Um, and and I think that's something that they perhaps wouldn't otherwise have had. And um, likewise, you know, um, if they if one of them is slightly further ahead on something than another, then actually they can share some of their experiences, um, as well as to the connections that uh, are in you know in your um, you know your catalogue of people that you've met along the way. Um, so testing and feedback, I think this is an interesting one. I, I invested in a menopause, um, a digital menopause uh, business uh, earlier this year. And um, having gone through that recently myself, um, I what was really interesting is they it was founded by a, a young lady who hadn't gone through the menopause and a man. And so they hadn't didn't always have the right um, understanding or sensitivities to the look and feel, the branding, the technology. So um, I think that, as, you know, so as a user, I could test what they were doing. Um, and then the last one, I think, is a sounding board. And this is a very, you know, it, it is the sort of um, a safe place for them to talk about some of the things that they wouldn't necessarily know how to talk about to anyone else. So there's an example where there are two co-founders and one of the found it sounds like their relationship isn't going that well. And so one of them approached me and wanted to talk about it and what they could do. And um, so I think that there's there's some conversations that are quite difficult to have. Um, and, and I think actually that's one of the things as a woman that you can really you know bring to the party if you're a female investor in a business is some of the some of the handling of or, or listening skills that um, may not come from elsewhere thank you laura right plenty of food to think about um at this point i'm going to um ask all our panelists to turn on their camera and hand over to simon who's going to moderate the the q a and Everyone, if you've got questions for the panel, please, please submit them via chat. We'll be, we'll be monitoring that. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And thanks everyone. Uh, to be honest, I think you've covered pretty much everything I wanted to ask you about already. But so, but it'd be great to sort of delve into some of these things in a little bit more depth. Um, but actually just a really fairly straightforward question to front up with, which is, you know, how, how much time should investors expect to put into this kind of support? And, and typically, how much time are you putting in? I think it's as little or as much as you want to, uh, or have the capacity to, to be honest. It's, it's like anything else, um, uh, you know, so much depends on, on what the company needs and what you have the time and skills to be able to do. I don't think there's any rule of thumb. I agree with Maya that just keeping in touch with the founders so that you have a bit of a feel for how the business is doing, because obviously it's not only in their interest that you support them, it is in your interest because you've invested your own um, valuable cash in them. Simon, I don't know if you want to get rid of the slide so that we're... Oh, okay. Well, you're uh, going Sarah's, to Sarah, Sarah's in control of that. I have... I, I am, I, yeah, there perfect. we go. That's much better. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Sorry, it's the producer in me. I can't help it. I know. I just, <laughs> you must just think that this is all horrendous. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Maya, uh, Laura, any thoughts on the sort of time you put into this, typically? I think it, it really goes, I, 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 you know, support what Lorraine said. I, I think what I found is that it goes in cycles. And so, one of the, you know, one of them will go through, you know, they're preparing for their next raise. And so therefore they're all going through, you know, this whole sort of soul searching and what's the right financial plan. And therefore they, they will pull on you more. And then once they're through the raise, then, they, you know, you don't hear from them for a while. So, um, you know, I, and then and others, you know, I, I, you know, I, again, I, I, I send them a little prompt to email and sometimes I don't hear back. So I think it really depends yeah, it depends on what they need. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd agree, I'd agree with that. I mean, I tend to probably give more of my time to the smaller startups mm. um, with less investors and then the ones with uh, a larger group of investors I kind of rely more on the quarterly updates. And then if I see something where I think I can help, I'll get in touch. Um, but yeah, it, it really depends case to case. It's quite it's, it's quite interesting. There's, there's one business that, um, doesn't have very many investors or advisors around them and 
what I found is that it went the other way. You know, I was getting kind of, you know, weekly, fortnightly calls in a diary, lots of people pulling on. And then you, you know, actually then you have to figure out, well, what, you know, what are the boundaries here? I'm willing to give, you know, I've given some money and therefore then, and then how much time can I really give? Because, you know, it can, it can, you know, it can take up quite a lot of time if you let no, that, it. That, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, when I was speaking to founders, I think there's not always an expectation that, that uh, it's the other way around, that they're worried that as investors, we'll be a little bit too involved. And, but mm. actually you're suggesting that sometimes they want a bit more involvement than you, you guys got the capacity to give. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, look, get, getting down into the sort of nitty gritty of this, I mean, what are some of the typical challenges that you've helped founders with? And again, these questions are just open to all of you. So, you know. Um, so in my case, because my background's in data, a lot of the time it has to do with analytics or software related um, things of that nature. So it's very much sector expertise that I've helped them out with or kind of connecting them to people. I think I often get involved in some of, if you like, the softer issues. Um, there was one case, uh, a company I was actually supporting uh, for Channel 4. Um, and after they'd taken on investment, A, that was such a different thing for them to suddenly have an external investor, but also all sorts of issues arose between the founders. It was almost like being a marriage guidance counselor. Um, and I managed to steer them through it and they came through it and, you know, as a much more solid unit, in fact, um, which was definitely in the interest of the company. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes if you're not the person who goes in to talk about money, they will confide in you in all sorts of other things that they don't like to admit to the people who are talking about the money and looking at the numbers. Um, and those can be around people issues and those people issues can be quite devastating for the company if they're not sorted out. Yeah, I love the idea that they're softer issues than tech. Well, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> no, I know what you mean, but it's... Um, Laura, any thoughts from yeah. you on the sort of stuff that you where you roll yeah, your sleeves I, up? What? I think some of the things actually are... Um, us when they when they've got a hunch or they want to do so there's a really a good example where they've got the branding agency to do their whole look and tone of voice and brand and photography and they just weren't loving it and they were like and they but they hadn't didn't have the experience to know is this are we just not getting it or is this a bit of a crappy job and how should we deal with this new this agency now and so you know having that kind of second opinion but then some guidance about actually these are really the practical steps go back to them you know uh, I think you know that it was reassuring them that they were thinking along the right lines mm. um, but also giving them some really practical next steps to do okay great well uh, you started actually Lorraine you were getting into something I wanted to ask specifically about so let, let let's go there um disagreements and clashes between co-founders now, obviously, you know, we all like it to be harmonious between co-founders. <laughs> I know I do, but, you know, it isn't always. So what, how, how do you, how do any of you deal with that? I mean, what I've done in the past is sat down with each of them and got them, you know, for a start, allowed them to unburden themselves and completely give me an honest assessment of why they were getting very irritated um, with their co-founder. And, and often it's a sort of perception that one or other of them isn't quite pulling their weight. And sometimes it's about explaining that they have very different roles and it might look like one person isn't pulling their weight, it's just their role is different. Um, so getting each of them to unburden themselves to you. And then, as I say, a bit like marriage guidance, all sitting around a table and trying to work through those issues together. And sometimes just saying it seems to help resolve it because what tends to happen is that people bottle it up and by the time they address it they are absolutely this exploding point so when they do address it it comes out as much more ferocious than they ever intended it to um and i mean i i had it again with one of the production companies that i help um two founders not not getting on very well recently and one of them was like well you know he doesn't do anything that I want him to do. And the other's like, well, what's the point of me doing it? Because he only does it anyway. <laughs> you know, there's this sort of, and I'm like, you know, you don't let him get on with it. He's not going to take the responsibility. So, you know, those, though, that's what I'd say is encouraging an airing of the views and a level of honesty 
and usually there is, you know, usually it, it, there is wrong or right on both sides. So it's not as black and white as it might seem. Mm. Mm. You other guys, have you got any thoughts on the founder clashes? I love the yeah, idea of I, marriage I, guidance because sometimes it's that as well, but. <laughs> I haven't I haven't dealt with a kind of full on founder clash, but it's the kind of, you know, sometimes I think it, you know, I've seen quite a lot of the bubbling, niggling, oh my God, it's really annoying. And I think there's a, an example at the moment where um, two founders and they're just having, you know, they're, they're disagreeing on, you know, how much money to raise, what are the priorities, what should, you know, is the money on revenue or is it money on, you know, building to scale and so therefore not immediately, obviously, revenue. And, you know, it, it, both of them had got to sort of a really quite, you know, they were both entrenched in their views. Um, and and actually, what we did, you know, what I ended up doing was going, look, well, actually, let's let's make a, create a sort of set of really objective ways of us evaluating what's most important. So let's take the emotion out of it and let's look at the facts that will then help you realise what's the right thing for the business. Uh, and and so I think actually broker it's kind of brokering, but we're using using a process to get them over it. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I'm aware that we're we're always saying that we really want to we really want founders that are absolutely tenacious. But you know, sometimes tenacity is a synonym for just bloody mindedness. And yeah, you know, that, I I I have absolutely no idea how you balance that. But um, I think okay. entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs are quite similar to creative people, um, actually. Um, in that you know they're they're they like to be at the center of things. They want to drive things forward in their own way. Um, you know, that's why they're entrepreneurs. And so, you know, there's the great thing about that is that there's this huge energy and drive to get things done. And the negative side can be that they don't ever want to listen to anybody about anything um, or take on board criticism. And I think the other thing that I've seen is people become incredibly defensive to the extent that they block out all criticism um and that's not a good thing either yeah yeah so i think what you're saying lorraine is that you've chosen not one but two entirely different arenas in which to be involved with the most difficult people imaginable is exactly. well done exactly. that's great okay uh so i've got a whole bunch of questions here but they're already sort of pouring in from our adoring public so i'm, I'm gonna um i'm gonna put some of them over and sorry about uh, looking down here and reading out, but we've got a great question from Alex, who starts off by saying, Lorraine's point about the likely inexperience of the founder leadership team is very well made. Uh, I agree that it's important to be supportive and adopt a coaching approach, but how does the panel believe it is best to approach the often thorny subject uh, of strengthening management capability to address weaknesses and ensure the business has the right skills? That's over to all of you. <laughs> I, I think it's quite interesting because as businesses evolve they need different skills and part of it is getting the management team to recognize that you know at what stage do you need the COO at what stage do you need a dedicated marketing person or strategy person you know that you move from everybody multitasking and multi-skilling towards specialisms over time you know, also as businesses grow, you need an HR function. There are things like that. And so, you know, schooling people in that, or if you're on the board trying to point that out and encouraging them to take it on, because at the same time, they, you know, they don't necessarily want to spend money on what they might see as an, as an overhead. But there's a sense of where you can't grow if you don't build your capacity. Mm. Um, yeah, I would say there's, there's this point of um, kind of everything that you do in the business has to be about the business, not about the individual. And um, what I find is that, you know, th this kind of concept I talked about earlier about values, the fact that the business always needs to be the priority. If you can set that culture up front, then, you know, you the founder should be hiring people that are better than them to do all these different areas. And also people will recognize okay, I'm the marketing director now, but you know what, I'm probably not going to be the CCO because I don't have the skill set. But the best thing for the business will be to hire that person and I'll be happy with whatever, you know, comes out of that. Um, so it really is kind of a cultural mind shift um, to make sure that, the, you know, the, the 
everybody's got this single focus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's also, um, so with a business I'm working with at the moment, the CTO who's unbelievably busy, is also, you know, the, doing all the HR, all the finances, um, and is building the world's most complicated expenses system for their own business. I mean, it's just bonkers. And because I, I guess that, you know, they, they've had, they've, that's all they've had all the way up till now. And, you know, I've been kind of suggesting, you know, why, why don't you bring someone on? It might be, you know, it might be just one day a week to help you with some of this stuff. And the way, the thing that actually worked was, I just said, look, if you had an extra day a week, to work on other stuff what you know what could that what what could mm. that mean for the business yeah, that's a great so, question um and then you know actually it's definitely hit not him posting stuff in zero you know for hours on end so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 no no i think it's that great question isn't it it's if you know what you know which which role would you make yourself redundant in is yeah. the um, um look, can i ask i'd like to ask about reporting but down in the weeds on this but you know, we, we recognize at Angel Academy that, you know, reporting from founders to, to investors is important. But I guess my questions are, what, why? Why do we, why is it important for us? Why is it important for them? And what kind of frequency and detail do you expect in, in, in reporting? Oh, I clearly that was a really boring question, wasn't it? I, I, it's, like, it's, my, it's my best question. Somebody else go first. <laughs> Yeah, I, so I mean, I, ideally, what I really love is having a really short, sharp monthly update. It doesn't have to have loads of stats and tons of slides, but I just want to know, are there any wins? What are they worried about? And a few of the businesses, I do that really well. You can tell that they haven't spent hours preparing it but it just means I know what's going on and um, a couple of them are just really good at just saying look this is the help we need does anyone have x that they can do for us um, I think it's you know some of the accelerators train them to do that and you can tell that those are the ones that, <laughs> yeah, have, that yeah. do it really well um, and then and so I'd say that that I'd prefer that than once every six months a massive great big powerpoint yeah, with loads okay. of charts that actually you know it's, t it's taken a lot of time but you 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 know you've lost contact with them you don't quite know what's going on so yeah. I mean that that would be my personal preference um I'd say uh please don't ever send attachments they <laughs> <laughs> it will Never. not get read <laughs> yeah. so um yeah just I would say probably for me quarterly because uh, it's hard to demonstrate a lot of traction at least that will keep my attention every month. So kind of quarterly touch points. I like things in threes. So kind of three highlights, three KPIs, three things that you need to work on, you know, areas of improvement. And then very importantly, like anything that you need from us, any help, et cetera. Because it's hard to know how to help them if they don't ask and they don't tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Brevity and clarity. Uh, and I agree, quarterly is, is enough. Um, and I love Maya's honesty, no attachments. Because <laughs> we're all so busy. Um, but the, you know, the other thing is that there was one company that I invested in and they kept saying, we're ahead of our KPI or, you know, they always seem to be doing better. I was like, well, what was your KPI? I don't even know what your KPI was. <laughs> so how do I know whether you're ahead of it or not? So, you know, I think sort of being a bit, being transparent is quite important. So I'm, I'm aware that as well as mostly investors that are on the on the call, we, we've got some founders as well. So why do you, what, uh, what are the benefits to doing these kind of reports for founders? I think it helps them focus uh, on, on their business, which is again why I think they shouldn't be too long. You know, we've all been in companies where the finance report, I, I mean, even when I was at the BBC, I remember... Uh, Greg asking the FD, you know, where what was the important page? And he said, well, page five. He said, well, why don't we just have page five? <laughs> <laughs> In the end, there are relatively few numbers that are important, and most of them can be shown on one page. So, you know, that thing of, of, of clarity of thought and clarity of focus is what will help the founder or CEO when they're compiling that report to just think, actually, how have we done this quarter? What did we slip on? What do we need? You know, it's those sorts of questions. Yeah, so actually accountability works two ways then. It's actually, you, it, the, the accountability is useful to the founder, you think? 
Yeah. I think it's also quite helpful to pull them out of the weeds. They're either very much in the detail or doing very high level pitches. So it kind of keeps that 30,000 foot view and keeping them honest about what the traction is. Yeah, no, that's interesting, yeah. And they have to do it for the board anyway. So I think the thing is, you know, they shouldn't make work for themselves. Do one set that's suitable for ev everybody. Um, and that again, you know, I think investors need to be cognizant of this, especially where there are multiple investors. I mean, Angel Academy counts as one investor. So it's not like all of us want different things, but if you're on alongside other investors, they might want different things. And I think there has to be some standardization because again, these are small businesses and you don't want them groaning under the way of reporting um, expectations. You know, they've got more important things to focus on. And as long as we're getting the key numbers and we can see, are they ahead, are they behind? That really is about it. Well, yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. And it touches on something I did want to ask about, which is and not necessarily specifically with regard to reporting, but is that um, but more about the general relationship with founders is quite a lot of our investments will involve at this stage quite a lot of individual investors. And, you know, some of those will be quite hands off, but not all. And I just wonder if there are sort of any, what are some of the issues that arise from, um, I, I see Laura's ordering a gin and tonic, I think there, was that? That's good that is my, it's my, uh, me a my drink, boy. laptop's about to run out of battery. Oh, so yeah. uh, um, no, no, just so, you know, where there's a, a lot of investors involved, and, you know, what, what, what are the issues that arise there in terms of the, you know, the relationship that you guys got with companies? Well, as I mentioned, I mean, I, I've sometimes found them bullying. Um, and unreasonable, um, the others, uh, uh, other investors. Uh, and that's quite tricky because, you know, I can remember on one of them, I actually said to Sarah, you know, this person is asking this, this, and this. And, and Sarah said to me, they're a smaller investor than us. So it's like, well, if we're not, oh, asking yeah. it, they said, you know, but the way this person behaved, I thought, you know, they must have put in gazillions or something. Mm. So I think there is that thing about it, it's got to be proportionate. Um, and it's got to be reasonable. Um, and, you know, it may be sometimes we would have to explain to other investors that we don't, we don't think that, that their approach is productive or constructive for the company. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm guessing that often those people are men as well, but, you know, I just, I'm just going to put that out there as a possi um, faint possibility. <laughs> um, in case they were, but I'm, I'm sure it could go the other way. I mean, I I'm sure... I saw one of the questions in the chat um, from Sonia is, um, you know, has anything unexpected happened? And I would say the unexpected thing has been the aggressive, uh, sometimes anti-female behavior that I've witnessed. And when, when I set up my company, um, we were looking for people to come and do um, commercial due diligence. And um, there were various people coming into pitch alongside, you know, to myself and the private equity company. And there were two guys who came in from a very well-known company and not once during the presentation did they look at me. They only looked at the private equity guys. Mm. And when, when they left the room, the private equity guys said to me, oh, I thought they were really good. And I said, I thought they were terrible. Did you notice they didn't look at me once? And I am the founder, you know, it's kind of like my business. And, you know, just be earlier when Maya and I were on the call and we were talking to Sarah about a, a, a company that, that Sarah's uh, been looking at. And one of the investors had actually said at a board meeting to the woman, the founder, could you leave your ovaries at home? I mean, <gasps> unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And, you, you know, you, and, and when you say it, it, to me, that is unexpected to hear that level. It, it must be, you know, like having somebody be racist to your face. I mean, it is like somebody being racist to your face, um, but you wouldn't expect that kind of behavior and certainly not at a board meeting. But the world of investment has been very macho, is very macho. Most of the advisors are male. Again, when I go back to when I set up my own company, you know, when we were, were doing the first big deal, there would be about 20 people in the room. There would be me, maybe a junior woman in the finance team or maybe a tax expert and maybe one person in the legal team who would be a woman out of 20 people. It was quite surprising to me. And we are backing through Angel Academy, we're backing female led companies and they are coming up against this. And again, tech is very male dominated. Um, 
And, you know, they can, some of them be a bit on the spectrum to, to be very um, politically correct, but you know what I mean? They're <laughs> not necessarily got emotional intelligence and they don't pick up on things. And that is what I find shocking or, or hard to help founders deal with because they've got to navigate their way through all this and still come out smiling and still be positive about their business. Yeah. <clears throat> I feel that, <clears throat> excuse me, I now need to sort of play an abasement role for the, the whole of my gender. I do apologize, really. Well, but... All the men who are in Angel Academy are by definition. <laughs> Okay. We hope so. We try to be. We're just doing our best. Just doing our we best. Wouldn't, we wouldn't let them in, would we, Sarah? <laughs> um, sorry, um, Maya, Laura, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, for my, I haven't, you know, I, my dealings with the, um, businesses, with the founders, tends to be one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, there's one or two instances that I've been in kind of board meetings but it tends to be a relationship I have just with them. And so, um, and I haven't come across that many of them that have been pushed around that much by other, uh, by other investors. So it's, yeah, it's not something, you know, I'm not sure how I deal with it, with it, with dealing with any of the stuff that I've heard from Lorraine, but I, ha I haven't come across it. No, well, glad to hear it. It's like, yeah, luckily, yeah. <laughs> can, can I ask you um, about uh, balancing you know, I think it was you, Laura, use the phrase cheerleading, uh, you know, balancing the cheerleading, but with being, uh, I, I think the, the de rigueur phrase is a, a, a critical friend, but you know, when you need to have a bit of a word. Yeah, um, I guess my, so my background was being a, a, a strategy consultant. I mean, that's what consultants are paid to be critical, uh, basically, you know, you always have to point out what's wrong. And so I think, what I learned over the last two years is that's not really, you know, you just, that's not the way to build them up and to help actually. So I think you very much have to start from the cheerleading. And then once you've built up some sort of rapport, you can then be the critical friend, but always in a much more positive way than I would have been had I been doing a piece of consulting work for somebody. So I think mm. it's, um, you know, and, I, and, and so I, 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 I've now become a lot more, positive than I probably than than negative you know critical I think um over time it just works better right does it make um, you feel happy does it make you feel happier does it make, make me feel happier yeah you feel you bring positivity into the world now oh my god so you know it's it's yeah. really I, th I think so and it's just you know these these you know we've invested in these business because the founders are amazing you know mm. we they we put them through their paces, you know. They've built these incredible businesses, and probably they're getting lots of. They're already being probably fairly critical on themselves, and so actually someone going, "Look, you're doing a really good job. These are amazing. You know, I've seen this bit. I think that might be. You know, there are some. There's some more. Um, you know, I think you could push it harder. Or I think you know. But what about thinking about it in this way? Or I've seen someone do this. What about it? Um, you know, and that, that's as really as far as you can go as an investor, you know, all you can do yeah. is make helpful suggestions, you don't have any other real sway, you know, so if you do it nicely, I think it might, you know, it might land better. What about, what about you, Maya, where are you on the uh, critical friend, <laughs> so, stroke, cheerleader spectrum? So I definitely think you need to be positive, but um, somebody one time gave me some really good advice, she said tap into your uh, parental um, instincts, you know, how would you work with your children to give them the feedback? We all know that kind of being negative with them doesn't work. So, you know, ask questions, kind of take that therapist mode of where, you know, it's like, well, do you think this worked? <laughs> Why do you think that didn't work? And then lead them down a path to where actually they're answering that question and understanding where something went wrong or why they're getting the criticism, but it's their idea, but you're planting those seeds. And I, I found that that approach is actually working really, really well um, in kind of conveying a maybe not so positive message because it makes a person reflect on what they've actually done. Okay. There's me thinking parenting and just involved saying, because I told you, <laughs> I thought that, isn't that how you do? 
But then they get all grumpy and don't talk to you, and you don't want that. (laughs) Tell me about it. Okay. Um, Great. Thank you. Uh, So, uh, yeah, evaluations. We have we touched briefly on valuations, but um, I think Alex has asked this about uh, what advice would the panel give on agreeing next round valuations. I mean, I, I, I'm to be totally honest, I just think it's so hard to put a stamp on companies when they're this small. So a kind of, as long as the logic is sound from the founder and the board has signed it off, I tend to get on the train. Um, it, and if it's a down valuation, um, just need to understand exactly why that's the case. Um, but. Yeah, I I guess uh, from my point of view, I just don't spend too much time on it and and tend to kind of go with the consensus. Yeah. Lorraine, Lorga, Laura, where are you on that? I I mean, I'd say the same. I I haven't spent huge amounts of time talking valuations with the businesses. I think, again, I'm more interested in their plan and the kind of financial plan and some of the assumptions that go the way they're thinking about it rather than the, the, the amount per se. And I think one of the benefits of being part of a group like Angel Academy is that we all discuss it. And it, you know, it, it is, as, as Maya said right at the beginning, it is an art, not a science at this stage. And the, a lot of a business's valuation is about its potential rather than what it's actually delivering. And so you have to kind of assess whether, particularly say between the first round and the second round, has there been any progress? Is that progress enough to be reflected in an increased valuation or in or <laughs> has it gone backward and need a, a decrease in the in the valuation I mean I would have thought if it's got a decrease in the valuation you probably don't want to invest a second time I, I wouldn't personally um, but I value hearing experts and you know having a discussion around a table or, or around a zoom on whether people feel the valuation is right and you can tell, you know, sometimes founders get crazy opinions of value. You can sort of tell <laughs> when it's crazy and you can tell when it feels roughly in the right ballpark, but not something to get overly hung up on with. It sounds odd to say it, but, you know, it, it, it's not the be all and end all at, at this stage with the sorts of stage of development of companies we're talking about. No, the, I mean, you know, someone who, who handles the, the incoming companies for Angel Academy, there are those occasional moments where you, your draw job, draw drops, it's like, wow. But, um, you know, I, I just found in discussion with, with you know, between our group and, and founders that it it's very much about flushing out the founders thinking more than anything else, really, you know, how do they think, how do they roll generally, but... Um, I'm aware that we're we're coming up nearly on time, but uh, a couple of things to ask you. So, um, uh, are there any sort of? I mean, you've already talked a little bit about cheerleading, and, and Laura, you talked about um, a little bit about social media. But uh, aside from this, rather, you know, getting down in the detail of the company stuff and supporting founders, are there what are the kind of e- easy wins and and sort of light light touch approaches to supporting your portfolio? from a cheerleading perspective well just in general you know what are the ways that you you know so you know for a you know a lot of our investors are in fact i think all of our investors are very time poor and incredibly busy and won't necessarily have vast amounts of time to put into supporting an investment so what what are some of the easier wins there i think be a customer you know if you can buy the product um, and then give them feedback on it you know it's, it's always useful to get the customer's feedback and that's a very an easy win and a way to support the business. Yeah, I, I think an, another easy win is is to introduce useful people. You know, it actually doesn't take much effort. But if you've worked with someone that you know, I know on the financials or someone who's great at PR, and you know, actually that can make a huge difference to a business just to put them in touch with a great vendor or a supplier. Um, and it takes an email. That's it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. O- opening doors for them. But I was taken when we were having a discussion, you know, before we did this panel, and Laura talked about, you know, the whole social media thing. I mean, helping them build their profile by tweeting and retweeting, it doesn't take much of your time at all, but will help them a lot because suddenly everybody who follows you sees you talking about them. Yeah. Uh, 
and also just makes them feel good about themselves because mm. there's a bit of a noise and you've noticed and you've liked their Instagram post or their, their Twitter, you know, yeah. tweet.